Hello everyone. Today, we're continuing our deep dive of Richard Dawkins and Yan Wong's book, The Ancestor's Tale. In this episode, we're going to be investigating the origin of behavioral modernity, also known as the supposed Great Leap Forward. So, let's jump right in. Previously, the farmer's tale occurred around 12,000 years ago, whereas this tale occurs around 50,000 years ago. Now, this chapter occupies a total of two pages in the ancestor's tale, so we're going to stray a bit to get a fuller understanding of the events of the so-called Great Leap Forward. The structure of this tale will be threefold, first chronology, then anatomy, and then behavior. So, chronology. Our last tale took place at the end of the Paleolithic, or the very start of the Neolithic, 10,000 BCE. The Paleolithic began about 3.3 million years ago in the Pliocene, and together, the Paleolithic and Neolithic comprise the Stone Age. Remember from the last tale that there isn't a singular start or end date for either the Bronze or Iron Age, because cultures change at different rates. Both the previous and the current tale operate at the boundary between cultural and biological evolution. Now let's talk about anatomy. This is the last tale in which we'll encounter anatomically modern humans, or AMHs, the subset of Homo sapiens that includes us today. That is to say, the AMHs who participated in the Great Leap Forward looked like us. In fact, Cro-Magnon simply refers to AMHs who lived from about 50,000 to 10,000 years ago, so there's really no reason to use this term. Hence, we're not going to use it for the remainder of the video. Now, researchers previously thought that the origin of behavioral modernity, a term that we'll get into shortly, coincided with the origin of AMHs around 40,000 years ago. However, as paleoanthropologists continued to dig, pun intended, the evidence has steadily pushed our species back past that date, with AMHs originating between 160 and 195,000 years ago, long predating the supposed origin of behavioral modernity. This means whatever the causes may be for behavioral modernity, it's not simply a consequence of our arriving at a particular anatomy. Furthermore, as hominin habitats and remains have been further investigated, it has become increasingly difficult to isolate what have previously been considered AMH behaviors strictly to AMH. The earliest evidence of symbolism in the form of ochre pigment dates to about 162,000 years ago from South Africa, and findings like that have unsurprisingly changed a lot of ideas about human evolution. For example, finding Neanderthals together with AMHs in both the Middle East and Western Europe means Neanderthals can no longer be equated with the Mousterian tool industry, and AMHs can't be presumed to be the sole users of the Upper Paleolithic tools. Since the archaeological record indicates that our brain size hasn't greatly increased in the past 50,000 years, what therefore changed? Researchers have hypothesized a variety of reasons, some genetic, some ecological, and some cultural. Probably the answer is a result of all three. Some researchers have argued that the common ancestor of AMHs and Neanderthals, i.e. Homo heidelbergensis, had a more restricted working memory compared to AMHs, but relatively simple mutations in the lineage leading to AMHs around 50,000 years ago increased our memory capacity as well as abilities to solve new tasks and deviate from well-established patterns of behavior. Or, perhaps our future capacity for modern behavior evolved around 700,000 years ago as a result of the speciation event separating us from Neanderthals and Denisovans. Researchers also note that the origin of behavioral modernity occurred shortly after the start of oxygen isotope stage 3, when climatic amelioration briefly lessened the harsh effects of the last glacial maximum, which had started in the previous stage. Thus, researchers propose that populations grew during this time and that cultural innovations during this period could have helped increase the fitness of the populations, allowing those innovations to be maintained. As the populations grew in size, this would look in the archaeological record like the origin of culture, when really it would have reflected an increase in the statistical likelihood of culture being preserved, a taphonomic issue rather than an evolutionary one. 
Further research on this potential taphonomic bias should investigate why preservation of cultural artifacts by Homo neanderthalensis and archaic Homo sapiens occurred at all. It was thus proposed that perhaps increased interconnectedness between growing human populations may have heightened the awareness of those populations to each other. So, people constructed beads, headdresses, and other adornments to help define social boundaries. A 2018 paper echoes this, saying, quote, We suggest that the increase in connectivity could have occurred via a combination of long-distance population dispersals and an increase in intensity of local networks of interpopulation interaction, both within each species, modern humans, and Neanderthals, and between them, close quote. Earlier in time, a similar diffusion of culture may have occurred between Neanderthals and Denisovans, given their extensive genetic relationship, suggesting interactions that were not infrequent. In essence, an already existing neural capacity was harnessed to function in increasing the fitness of the population through non-biological means, that being the exacerbation of existing hominin sociality, and this capacity thereafter ran wild, generating various cultural phenomena that served no fitness function at all. So, we've mentioned behavioral modernity repeatedly, but what exactly does that term mean? Well, that depends. In a literal sense, modern behavior includes everything from doing agriculture to playing video games, but of course that's not relevant to humans living 50,000 years ago. Some researchers prefer to restrict modern behavior to behavior practiced exclusively by AMHs, meaning that behavioral modernity actually originated between 160 and 195,000 years ago. A third approach is more theoretical. The set of specific behaviors that separate AMHs from other hominins is modern behavior. Well, what then is that set? This has been the subject of controversy as a number of paleoanthropologists have essentially argued that the archaeological record of Western Europe should define modern behavior. However, as mentioned previously, a closer look at Neanderthals has muddied the waters on what technologies are restricted to AMHs. This record includes, quote, a transition from flake to blade technologies, the appearance of specialized tool types such as burr ends and end scrapers, the rapid proliferation of novel tool types, the extensive use of artifacts shaped from non-lithic materials, e.g. bone, antler, ivory, and an increase in the degree of the standardization of tool types. Traits such as these in combination with the sudden appearance of personal ornaments, a broadening of the subsistence base, increase in settlement and population size, and long-distance trade became a checklist against which the archaeological records of other regions were compared." Close quote. Other anthropologists like Sally McBrearty and Alison Brooks looked at the African archaeological record and conclude that modern behavior includes, quote, "...blade and microlithic technology, bone tools, increased geographic range, specialized hunting, the use of aquatic resources, long-distance trade, systematic processing and use of pigment, and art and decoration." These items do not occur suddenly together as predicted by the human revolution model, but at sites that are widely separated in space and time. This suggests a gradual assembling of the package of modern human behaviors in Africa and its later export to other regions of the old world. Close quote. Other anthropologists still, like Olga Sofer, have argued that any list detailing a set of supposedly modern behaviors is inherently problematic because behaviors are neither universal nor eternal. The whole issue is a matter of degrees, not types. This hesitancy is likely due to Neanderthals once again throwing a monkey wrench into characteristics once thought to be AMH exclusive. For example, Neanderthals have now been associated with utilizing aquatic resources and may have engaged in art and decoration as well. Regardless, most anthropologists tend to regard extensive symbolic behavior considered more advanced than what has been documented in Neanderthals as a hallmark of behavioral modernity but that's harder to detect in the physical record. This is because extensive symbolic behavior is often defined as language and codified social relationships, which are only preserved in morphology and habitat to a small degree. Other behaviors such as, quote, prismatic blade technology, worked bone, control and complex use of fire, specialized hunting, creation of art objects, and deliberate burial, close quote, have their roots in middle and even early Paleolithic cultures. In fact, researchers have argued that, quote, innovations indicative of modern cognition are not restricted to our species and appear and disappear in Africa, Europe, and the Near East between 200 and 40,000 years ago before becoming fully consolidated, close quote. 
Hyperprosociality means, quote, the tendency for regular everyday cooperation, which can entail a cost to the cooperator with unrelated individuals without the expectation of immediate payoffs, close quote. Social learning psychology, on the other hand, refers to, quote, high fidelity transfer of information to offspring and group members by relying intensely on social learning through imitation with a focus on process, close quote. Some researchers have hypothesized that because AMH offspring spend a long time developing and learning to imitate processes such as language, their ontogeny can be used as a proxy for this ability. Fossils indicate that Neanderthal offspring developed faster than AMH offspring, presumably placing a limit on the quality of information transfer and retention. In conclusion, extensive symbolism, hyperprosociality, and social learning psychology are three characteristics that contribute to so-called behavioral modernity. None of these are unique on their own, nor do they appear suddenly without predecessors, as is documented in earlier ancestor hominins. What defines behavioral modernity depends on which characters you choose, and, even still, the whole event was evolutionary to the bone. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.